These are the words of Hebrews 12, verse 28. And when I moved to Little Rock, a friend gave me this verse and said, I'll be praying it for you this year. Well, it was a good verse for me because I did feel like my life had been picked up and shaken and dumped upside down. So I'm seeing a little recognition. Maybe you guys have had this experience too. I'm not the only one whose life has been shaken a little bit. Um, I have three wonderful children. My youngest is in first grade. And when he was just a couple of months old, my husband got very sick. And he had a rare neurological disorder called Guillain-Barre syndrome. He was paralyzed. Um, he had a hospital stay and treatment and a year of really intense therapy uh, in a lot of different areas for his body. And um, our life was just suddenly turned upside down. So suddenly I had the, uh, a nursing infant, two little girls, a husband who couldn't eat or walk or really do anything by himself, and he certainly couldn't work. And we had a very uncertain future. It was a really long journey for his recovery, but he's your pastor now, and you see him up here every week, and you know that he fully recovered. So we felt a huge amount of relief and gratitude because he did recover. He com recovered completely. And we were really ready for our lives to just go back to normal. I know you've had this feeling too. But my body at the end of his recovery said, I've had enough. <laughs> And uh, I had had, you know, three babies. I'd had a miscarriage. I, my hormones were just all out of whack. I felt like for years I had always awakened to a cry for food or a cry in fear or a cry for help or someone who needs mommy every hour of the day. And I was so tired. I was tired physically, tired emotionally, tired spiritually, can you think of another way to be tired? If you can, I was that tired too. Um, I was just worn out and my body was filled with inflammation and I had so many viruses and constant infection and my immune system was just so weak and I was just so sick and pitiful and in pain and couldn't sleep and miserable and our life didn't really go back to normal. I'm really thankful I've moved off that point of crisis. I've worked with a lot of really good doctors, but I never really got back to a fast pace of life. I never really got back to the normal I expected, and I've had to really change my life to accommodate my new limitations. I don't go out a lot at night. I don't go out a lot on the weekends. I don't do extra trips. I don't volunteer. I don't do anything extra. I just come to church and try to serve my family, and I just can't do a lot of extra. When I do, I just get so worn out, and I get so sick, and I get so pitiful, and I don't ever want to go back there <laughs> again. It was terrible. Uh, maybe you've had an experience that really turned your life upside down, that caused you to really shake. Sometimes we do go back to normal. Sometimes we're rescued from whatever it is. Other times we are changed and we will never be the same. Sometimes you have a loss. It will never come back. You may not see that person again. You may not be able to recover. You may have an illness that will last your lifetime. And we bring a lot of burdens here tonight. You know, we named our event Finding Rest. Uh, last year we named it that because I had a psalm. I felt like God used to minister to me in my weakness and not in my strength about finding rest in God. Uh, I found I really needed that rest, and you guys did too. <laughs> so this year we're finding rest in God's unshakable truths. And I'm going to be sharing from the book of Hebrews in the New Testament. If you've got your Bibles or a tablet and you want to pull it up, feel free to go ahead and open up to Hebrews chapter 12. But this was really a, a book of the Bible, a letter written to a group of people. It would have been read to them. And they were a people who believed that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. They believe that Jesus gave his life uh, as a sin offering for them, a once and for all perfect sacrifice so that they could have a relationship with God, enjoy eternity with God in heaven. And their belief separated them from many of their friends and family. 
it isolated them in their culture. They were surrounded by people who had different ideas, different beliefs, different ideologies, and uh, they experienced a lot of persecution for what they believed. In addition to that, this was kind of a mature body of people who believed in God, but they also experienced all of the normal hardships of life that we all endure. Uh, they had sicknesses. They had miscarriages. They went through childbirth. They struggled with financial difficulties. They experienced loss in so many ways. And uh, they're very similar to us actually in this way. This group of people was very weary. <laughs> They were growing faint-hearted, and they were kind of asking some questions like, is our faith in God really worth it? Is God ever going to fix the brokenness in our world, the brokenness they saw with injustice, with evil, with persecution? They looked around at their world, and they just wondered, is God going to fix this? In their own lives, they struggled with brokenness, broken marriages, broken children, <laughs> so many broken relationships. Uh, they had their own poor choices that they had made, and they also endured brokenness from other people. They were betrayed. They were beaten. They were abused. And they were just growing weary. They were wondering, you know, is it worth it to still believe in God, to still trust God? to fix it, to persevere in our faith. And they needed some encouragement. And this is a really great book, I think even for our church. You know, we have a lot of new friends and guests here. I don't know all of your stories, but a lot of you here, I do know your stories. And I know some of you just getting here tonight was a huge effort. You know, you really need rest in your life, rest from your burdens and rest from the brokenness that you're having to struggle through every day. And uh, you may be like these people, like me, where you really need encouragement to continue to be faithful, to continue to pursue God, to trust him through those hard things. So I want to encourage you, I'm going to read a long passage of scripture in a minute. And when I read it, I want you to listen for a couple of things that would have stood out to this original audience when they heard the letter. That's something we always want to do is try to figure out what, is the mess what did the message mean to the people who first heard it. And once we kind of figure out what it meant to them, then we can learn what does it mean for me. Uh, for this audience, they will be familiar with some of the references that may for us seem new or different or very diff distant. So uh, we'll talk through that. This is a nice thing about a girl's night. Uh, we can have a lot of deep theological discussions. We can talk about very practical things. Uh, we can, we're going to talk about a lot of hard things. But it's so nice to be with girls. We can just talk it all through. You know, that's one of the things I miss <laughs> the most about being in college and having, like, all my dorm mates and living in an apartment with girls is... Um, we just talk all the time. We talk while we're doing hair. We talk while we're getting dressed. We share outfits. Uh, we have like five different conversations going, and we know what is going on in every single conversation. Uh, actually, this passage of scripture is ideal for women because it's a little bit complicated. It's got a lot of ideas going on. Uh, it's good because it can keep our interest. And as women, we just are so brilliant, it's no problem for us to follow. So uh, y'all are just going to do great tonight. So I'm really excited to share it with you. Like I said, you can open up to Hebrews chapter 12. And specifically listen for these two mountains. We're going to be talking about this idea of two mountains in this passage. And uh, it's Hebrews 12. I'm going to start in verse 14. Like I said, it's a little bit of a long passage, so just kind of listen, and then we'll talk it out. Verse 14, make every effort to live in peace with all men and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one misses the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. See that no one is sexually immoral or is godless like Esau, who for a single meal sold his inheritance rights as the oldest son. Afterward, as you know, when he wanted to inherit this blessing, he was rejected. He could bring about no change of mind, though he sought the blessing with tears. You have not come to a mountain that can be touched 
and that is burning with fire, to darkness, gloom, and storm, to a trumpet blast, or to such a voice speaking words that those who heard it begged that no further word be spoken to them, because they could not bear what was commanded. Even if an animal touches the mountain, it must be stoned. The sight was so terrifying that Moses said, I am trembling with fear. But you have come to Mount Zion, to the heavenly Jerusalem, to the city of the living God. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly, to the church of the firstborn whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all men, to the spirits of righteous men made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. See to it that you do not refuse him who speaks. If they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, how much less will we if we turn away from him who warns us from heaven? At that time his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. The words once more indicate the removing of what can be shaken, that is created things, so that what cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Let me give you a little history run through so we're all kind of caught up. Uh, in the Bible, we're told about a very important covenant promise given to Abraham and Sarah as a married couple. And this promise is given to him. God promises three things to Abraham and Sarah. He promises them many, many descendants. So many descendants that outnumber the stars in the sky, which was a big miracle because Sarah was very old and also barren. Then he promises them land. And finally, he promises a blessing will come through this family for all the world. Now, they didn't really know what that blessing was, but they were ready to be obedient. Uh, this spiritual blessing was passed on to their children and their children and on and on for generations. And um, this is a, a really important covenant. It's uh, an important part of the Bible that helps us understand a lot of the pieces of the Bible. That's one thing I love about the Bible. It's kind of like a big puzzle piece and all the, all the pieces fit together. And it really makes sense when you begin to understand the story and kind of put it all together. So they have this covenant promise and um, many, they have a child. Uh, many, many years later, God does provide so many descendants, they outnumber the stars in the sky, and these people are kind of relocated to Egypt, and in Egypt they become slaves for 400 years, and they cry out to God, and you've heard that, I mean, even if you're not a Christian, if you don't know anything about the Bible, I know you've heard of Moses and the Ten Commandments, right? <laughs> it's big movies, documentaries, books, all kinds of stuff. So, this time period when Moses is leading the people out of Egypt, called the Exodus, he leads them out, and three months into their journey, they come to a mountain called Mount Sinai. And God really comes down on this mountain, and he gives the people the Ten Commandments, the law, uh, the sacrificial system that is so much a part of the Old Testament scriptures, was really kind of all the information was really brought down and given to the people at this time. And we're going to go through some of those passages. Uh, so they've got their promise of descendants. They're moving into their a promised land where the people can become a nation, a people group, where they can have their government and their own religion, uh, become their own people, have their own land. And they're waiting for this third promise, the blessing to all the world. Uh, now, we'll, we listen to this in Mount Sinai, is what we talked about with Moses. And later, these verses talk about Mount Zion. Mount Zion is also a very significant place for the people in the Bible a place they would easily recognize. Uh, there was a really famous king, David, in Israel. He's one of uh, Israel's most famous kings, a beloved king. And um, Zion is a, a city that he loved. It was a, a citadel that he conquered, that he made his capital, where he built his royal palace. Uh, it's a very uh, famous. It'll, it brings up a lot of memories. And I, I share that because... Um, I have some places in my life 
that really cultivate a lot of feelings and memories. Okay, for example, when I was 15 and my brother was 16, he went in the hospital for about a year. And every day after school, I would go to this hospital. We spent a lot of time in this hospital. The hospital is still there. And it was a time in our life when God really came and met our family in a time of uncertainty, a time of brokenness, and he really surrounded us there. Even now, if I drive by that hospital, I have memories come back. I remember being there. I have feelings of what it felt like to be there. Uh, it's a place of significance in my life. And you all have uh, places like that where you go somewhere and it may bring up some emotions in your life. Uh, I also have feelings when I go to the church that I was married in. My parents are still members there. And so whenever we go home to visit, we go to this church and we go in the sanctuary and I get like giddy, excited feelings. <laughs> I remember being in my big white dress and getting to walk down the aisle. And I know, you know, we're there for a church service, not my wedding, but that place evokes feelings and memories and they're good memories. And so we all have places like that. Uh, one of the neat things about this passage is that it mentions people and places that were very significant to the original audience. And so when they would have heard this read, they would have, it would have brought up these feelings for them. And so it's kind of new information for us, but for them, they were very meaningful places and they would have had very specific feelings about them. There were stories that were passed down from generation to generation, um, things, you know, your grandmother would have told you and she's tucking you in bed at night. Uh, these are places that were very meaningful to the people. And so I want you to kind of think about that, try to relate to the people people that this letter was written to and see if you can sort of put yourself in their shoes to experience what they were experiencing. Uh, the first verse is like 14 through 17. I don't have a lot of time to spend on those, but I do want to say Esau was a very familiar person for um, in the history of, of these people, of the, this original audience. And what is being emphasized here is that he was a person who did not value the spiritual inheritance he had. Uh, he would have been like a grandson to Abraham and Sarah. And they were wealthy. They had a lot of a physical inheritance to pass on. So that's great. <laughs> but um, he, they also had this spiritual blessing to pass on. And for him, it it was not something that he really valued. And I kind of found when I first read this that it was easy to be judgmental <laughs> to Esau. You know, sometimes you see someone do something or you read something and you think, who would do that? Who would give up their whole inheritance for a bowl of cereal? I mean, really. Like, come on, who would do that? And as I read and studied more, I'm thinking, I would do that. <laughs> I'm like that. It's awful. But he didn't, he's really highlighted here because he didn't recognize how valuable his spiritual inheritance was. And I feel like when I was really going through my hardest times, you know, I had the benefit of all of this theological education of growing up in church. And really what I wanted from God was just for him to fix it. You know, I didn't really care in that moment that much about my theological training. I didn't really care about truths that maybe were going to happen someday in eternity. I wanted God to fix my problem right now. And, you know, truthfully, I want God to fix your problem right now. I feel a lot of frustration in life when someone comes and talks to me about a problem, and I, I can't fix it. There's nothing I can really do or say to mend that brokenness, to repair that problem. Uh, sometimes you'll talk with someone or you'll experience in your own life, you know, you've got a long road ahead of you. And there's no way to really make that easier. It's just something we're going to have to walk through and it's not going to be fixed. The message of this passage is very simple, very clear, and very hard. What it tells us is that we experience God in brokenness, we encounter Him, and we encounter Him in joy. And just like these passages compare Mount Sinai, a time of trembling, a terrifying time, 
And then it uh, compares it to uh, Mount Zion, which was a, a celebration, a city, a mountain that evoked so many feelings. Uh, Mount Zion is mentioned more than 160 times in the Bible. And it's uh, a place God loves, a people God loves. It's a... Uh, just a, a magnificence about it, a celebration about Zion. Zion is mentioned from the very beginnings of the Bible all the way to the very end of the Bible. Zion uh, also has to do with uh, Calvary, with the sacrifice of Jesus. Zion is also prophesied. So for the end of the age, uh, there's a lot in the Bible that tells us what's going to happen after this life, you know, what's going to happen at the end of the age? When we die, what's going to happen? And the Bible has a lot to say about that. Um, the Bible talks about how at the end of the age, God will come and he will shake the earth, literally. And things that cannot remain will be washed away. And whatever he chooses to remain will remain with him. That he will actually shake, remake the earth and the heaven. Uh, this is very symbolic language, but I believe it's real and literal that Jesus will come back, that God will come back, and all of the brokenness that we experience in the world, he'll repair. Well, that's great news. I want God to fix all the brokenness. I just want him to do it right now and not wait. <laughs> But the hard message is that he promises he will fix it, but not yet. So let's go back over these verses. We're just going to talk it out a little bit. And I want you to think about them. These verses are sort of bracketed by God's holiness. So the beginning of this section talks about making every effort to live in peace with men and to be holy. And then at the very end of the verses, we're reminded again that God is a consuming fire. It's really this idea of his holiness again, a fire kind of representing how holy he is, how purifying he is, um, what he demands in a relationship with us, this holiness. So we kind of start with holiness, we end with holiness, and then we've, we've been given kind of this preface to the mountains, the discussion about the mountains encouraging us to value our spiritual inheritance. So that's sort of the backdrop. So verse 18 starts off again talking about Mount Sinai. And that's, of course, again, where Moses took the people, where God brought down his law, uh, where he set up his religious system for the people in the Old Testament. And uh, let's read it together, verse 18. It says, You've not come to a mountain that can be touched and that's burning with fire. Uh, the scripture records this story, and you can go back and read it, you know, in Exodus and Deuteronomy. But it's real, the people all gathered to this mountain. And I want you to kind of picture yourself like you were a person who would have come. Because when they all gathered and came, they were given a lot of instructions. Uh, they were told to bathe. They had all these very specific things that they had to do before they came to the mountain. And then when they came to the mountain, they were also told some very specific things like, you can't touch the mountain. If you touch the mountain, you will be killed. I mean, it's really, like, I know for you this is probably not happening, but when I tried to put myself, I, I put myself in the, kind of the place of these people, and I thought about myself as a young mother having a toddler coming up to this mountain and being told, if anyone touches that mountain, an animal, anyone, they will die. My heart start kind of beating fast because I'm thinking my little, my little one could slip out. <laughs> they could touch this, you know, and I'm thinking like, you know what I'd want to do is back up. Like, I don't need a front row seat. I can just back up. I don't need to be that close. You know, it, it was a, kind of a, a fearful and a holy way, an awe-inspiring experience for them. And the Bible says that the earth actually shook like an earthquake. The earth shook. It was kind of this huge announcement that something big is going to happen and God was showing up. He's coming down, but he's sort of like separate, like everybody stay back. I want to be with you, but we've got to kind of get this settled. We've got to get this sin issue settled. And he institutes this sacrificial system so that sin can be atoned for. So it's this idea of the law really showing us, the Ten Commandments showing us 
how we really need to conform to who God is, really showing us um, that we're not good at, we can't earn our way to heaven. There has to be another way. God's got to make a way for us to be good enough to have a relationship with him, um, to have a place with him, to have a spot with him in heaven. And you know, there's really nothing like brokenness to show us that, right? Sometimes we think, okay, I'm doing pretty good. I've got it together. And then something bad happens to us and we think, I am a total disaster. This is so hard. I don't have it together at all. And this is kind of the experience they have when they come to Mount Sinai and they have this earthquake. And then I want you to think of these, as we look at these verses, it kind of goes, uh, think of this mountain, this terrifying experience. God comes down with like a storm. So it's kind of dark. I mean, it was light, but now it's dark. And we'll just kind of look through these verses. They say, don't touch the mountain. Then a fire comes down on the mountain. And really, you know, fire is like wonderful at Christmas, right? You know, we want to toast marshmallows. You want to be warmed up. You have all these special memories around a fire. But fire can be really scary. We had a little small oven fire in our kitchen. And you know what I really want to do is like run. Take the babies and run. You know, it is scary when it's out of control. And so this is kind of, they see this fire come on top of the mountain. It's burning with fire. There's darkness. It's kind of a, a, a heaviness, a gloom, the Bible describes it, a despair, um, a not being sure what's going to happen. And really a powerful storm comes. And so kind of think of it as like, this, it's a really terrifying experience up on this mountain, and it's getting kind of like worse and worse and scarier and scarier. Um, then it says, to a trumpet blast. Okay, think about a trumpet blast. For the people at this time, you know, they have no electronics, anything like that. They communicate through a trumpet blast or something like that. They would use that for military things. They would use that for gathering of people to pass out information. Uh, I mean, you've got millions of people here in the wilderness. How are they going to communicate? And so they use this trumpet blast. But think of it more like a tornado siren, like a scary kind of alarm. It's giving. And then the Bible also says, so the trumpet blast, the voice speaking words. Um, so here is God's voice speaking, and it's authoritative. Uh, my husband is a really, just a very kind, loving person. He's kind of mild-mannered, uh, sort of a quiet temperament. And I have been amazed sometimes <laughs> at how he can, especially when our girls are playing a lot at night and making noise and doing gymnastics in their room and not going to sleep, and he will come out and he will say, Girls, you know, go to bed. It's this big, scary voice that's authoritative. You know, they don't really listen to me when I say it. But when he comes out and he uses a big, deep voice, they know he's serious. They better go to bed. And so this voice of command comes out. And they were so scared, they didn't want to hear it anymore. And the scripture actually records that they were so afraid by this whole experience of the earthquake and the storm and the darkness and the gloom and the fire and the trumpet blast. And it's just like getting worse and worse and worse. And they're scared and they don't want to hear it anymore. And they ask Moses to please, you know, become their mediator between them and God because they were so afraid of God's holiness. And they were coming without, without a mediator. And so they, that's why they asked Moses to come forward. And the scripture even says that Moses was so scared. Moses, described as a friend of God, was so scared that he was trembling with fear. That's pretty scary stuff. Um, I feel like in our lives, you know, have you experienced this with brokenness where things, are, you have a terrifying experience and then it just seems like it gets worse and it gets worse and it gets worse and we get lower and lower and lower. Okay, so what's interesting about this scripture, I really like it because I'm more of a dramatic person, and I really like things that are exciting. And first when I read this, I didn't think it was that exciting. But then when I started putting myself in the position of these people who would have had this terrifying experience at Sinai, 
I started reading the words, kind of feeling like I was them, and I came to verse 22, and it's this image of getting lower and lower and brokenness and fear, and then all of a sudden, here's this tiny little word, it's but, and it's just kind of like, what, there's hope? You know, it gets better, and here's what it says is that, uh, verse 22, you have come to Mount Zion, and it really is giving them hope, saying, okay, you know, it's not always going to be so hard. It's not always going to be so bad. There's Zion is a place of hope, a place of looking up. We've got these kind of two mountaintops that we're looking at. And we have our brokenness and we have this deep valley that we go through. And Zion is kind of helping us look up, take a look up to God and see what does he have for us. Uh, this is really even in this sense kind of helping us to look toward heaven to again value our spiritual inheritance, to remember what is coming for us. If we really believe in God, if we really believe his message, what is his plan for us? And is heaven worth the wait? And so it says here, you've come to Mount Zion, to the heavenly Jerusalem. Again, this is kind of letting us know that, yes, Zion is a real place uh, with real, a real physical place, but it's also symbolic of what God has for us to come. And he wants us to think about that. Uh, that's, that's something special. I realized, you know, growing up in church, Every church emphasizes different things. You, you can't teach everything, so you've got to uh, learn as you go and grow as you go. And I realized when after I became an adult, I thought, you know, I've never really studied heaven very much. I've studied so much about the Christian life, but I don't really know what I have to look forward to. And this is really a picture of saying, I want you to look forward past your, your temporal life circumstances, look past earthly things, look past things that can be shaken in your life to a time when your life will no longer have brokenness, no longer have tears, uh, where God will be there as a steady foundation and no more things will shake. He will come and fix a broken world. And God wants us to think about that, to meditate on that, to celebrate that, to be excited about that. And so he says, you know, think about that. Be at Mount Zion, come to the heavenly Jerusalem, to the city of the living God. He's, he's alive and he wants to spend eternity with us. He wants to have a relationship with us. And he wants us to think about that, even in the midst of our brokenness, to look forward to that. And then I love this part. You've come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly. That's pretty exciting because when your life is bad, you don't have a lot of joy. It's hard to celebrate. And this is a great reminder that, you know, angels are celebrating now. They celebrate when someone um, comes to know the Father. They will celebrate and we will have an eternity of celebration and not an eternity of brokenness. That's pretty exciting. Uh, the Bible says that this Mount Zion is kind of like as we kind of descended in the brokenness of Sinai, we kind of move up as we look towards Zion. It keeps getting better and better uh, to the joyful assembly, to the church of the firstborn, to those whose names are written in heaven. I mean, this is pretty exciting that God knows your name and he's got your, your name written in a book in heaven. Uh, this is something to look forward to. You've come to God, the judge of all men, to the spirits of righteous men made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. You remember the story of Abel in the Bible? These, these people would have definitely been familiar with this story. But remember there's two brothers and they didn't get along very well and they kind of had a rivalry and they were supposed to bring a sacrifice to God. And Abel brings a good sacrifice to God, and God is pleased with that. And his brother didn't like that. He became very angry and actually murders him. And so this is bringing up this, this good sacrifice that Abel brought. It's holding him up as a good example. And it's saying even that, that good sacrifice, just think something better has come. Jesus has now made a sacrifice that's once and for all that we don't have to keep making. We don't have to keep sacrificing. We don't have to be good enough because Jesus has done that for us. And he's speaking to us and he's telling us to come from darkness to light. And he's telling us to come from broken to healed. He's telling us to come from hurt to wholeness. And all of the, it's this kind of this picture that he's giving us. And he wants us to be excited about that, to look forward to that, to hope in that. Um, I have found that when I am 
discouraged, when I am suffering, I don't like it, I don't, I'm really, I'm anti-suffering, I don't want you to suffer, I don't want me to suffer, it's no fun, it's hard. And I find when I'm just discouraged or down, or even I also do this, if I'm just doing something mundane, you know, like washing dishes and it's just not very exciting, it's just kind of something we do over and over, my mind will drift. And I, will, I just automatically start daydreaming about what if my life were different? You know, what if I had a different job, a different life? What if I were doing something else with, with my, my life? life? And, and I, I call, call these my fantasy, fantasy jobs. jobs. And, and they're, they're just, just, I mean, I, mean, I, know, I know they're, they're not, not going to happen. happen. I'm really generally happy with my life. It's just we all go through times where we just kind of wish that we didn't have to be doing whatever we're doing. And so I will think about these fantasy jobs. So I'm going to share some of my fantasy jobs with you. Uh, the first fantasy job that I have when I want to be distracted is I would love to be a 1980s fitness instructor. <laughs> oh, oh, here I am. Look, I just think this would be so much fun to have giant hair. To, I mean, who gets to wear makeup like that out? And look at all the colors. I mean, these bright colored leotards and the leg warmers. And I'm, y'all know I would be good at this job. You know, like a five, six, seven, eight in March. <laughs> and grapevine. And left. You're awesome. You're rad. You know, I, I would be so good. Thank you. Yes, I'm like, I would have been so good as a 1980s fitness instructor. But that time has passed. I can't do that job. All I can do is think about me doing that job. Okay, my next fantasy job, when I was a little girl, and you know how people ask you, what would you like to do when you grow up? And I have a very patriotic heart, and so I would say I would like to be the first lady of the United States of America. <laughs> I thought this would be a wonderful way to serve my country while wearing an evening gown. <laughs> I recognize that's not going to happen to me. Actually, I'm thankful now I get to be the first lady to manual, and that's a much better job. I think we would all agree. <laughs> So that was one of my fantasy jobs. I also really would still like to do this, although I know it's probably not going to happen. I would love to be a news anchor. <laughs> Up next is humanitarian aid in Arkansas. And breaking news, I broke a nail. I mean, like, how fun would this be to get to be on TV and, like, all the shuffling the papers and being so important? I know I, I'm so, I know I would probably have to bleach my hair blonde. I recognize 90% of the newscasters are blondes. Okay. My last fantasy job that really is a super stretch for me, I know I couldn't do it, but it is like my dream. I would just love to do this, actually have little movie reels of a whole movie in my head that I would absolutely love to do is be a Navy SEAL. <laughs> and so here I am like at training, you know. Uh, I'm just so inspired by people who have this incredible set of skills that I just, you know, like you have this heart to you want to fix people's problems. And, you know, if I just feel like if someone were... If I saw someone being hurt, I, right now, all I can do for you if you're being carjacked is scream and call 911. I mean, I know, what am I going to do, throw nail polish at them? I mean, I'm so sorry. Please don't have an emergency when I'm your only hope. You know, wouldn't it be amazing if you saw some old lady getting robbed and you could actually you know, whip out the kung fu, whatever they do, like have a weapon and you've saved the day. I mean, can you imagine being able to sneak in someplace or you know how they swim under boats in the ocean and do all this, I don't know, fight sharks, whatever they, I, I just can't even imagine that someone has the skills to actually do this for a job. So I'm just thinking this is my dream job 
to be a Navy SEAL. And I feel like, you know, when we go through difficulties, we're talking about this Mount Sinai over here. And we're talking about Mount Zion over here. We've got this brokenness. And joy seems so far away. And we have this huge, you know, part of my Navy SEAL movie reel of me and my head is that, like, there's an unjust prison, you know, full of women and children who are suffering. And so I'm going to go in and set them all free, set a bomb, blow up this place so nothing bad can ever happen again. And then I'm going to run, and I have this terrible enemy chasing me, but I'm so fast and fit because I'm a, was, because of before I was a Navy SEAL, I was a 1980s fitness instructor. <laughs> and so I am like running across, and okay, I, I love this. Y'all know the shaky bridge, you know, from the playground? It's a suspension bridge, right? It's in like every action movie. It's also in my personal action movie is this shaky bridge. It's a suspension bridge. And a suspension bridge works. Uh, it's like the Golden Gate Bridge also. There, I mean, there are a number of real bridges. Uh, and it works by tension and compression. So I have set these people free. I'm running in my SEAL outfit, you know, like through this shaky bridge, but not, not like the Golden Gate Bridge, like the, you know, in the movies where there are, you know, the little planks and the ropes. I'm running totally sure-footed. And then I get to the other side and, you know, like they whip out those huge knives and you slice the thing and the people fall. And then I have a pink parachute I pull out. <laughs> And I land, like, in Paris at a cafe, all, like, pristine, you know, makeup's perfect. I'm drinking a latte. You know, this is how I want to be when I face hardships. Like, I want to be able to face it like that with professionalism and skill and trust in God. You know, I get to a hard thing, a brokenness in my life, and I want to believe that I can handle it, that I can take care of it, that I can rescue myself and save my family. But instead of being like a Navy SEAL, in reality, I'm like Kate Capshaw and in Indiana Jones in the Temple of Doom. <laughs> Is this... Seriously, we get to brokenness and we freak out. We think, I'm going to die. I cannot live like this. I can't live in this brokenness. Uh, so this is for real. We could take this down now that everyone's seen my terror. <laughs> but, um, you know, I really want you all to think about this idea of this suspension bridge, okay? Because we've got to have a way to get from brokenness to joy, right? And it, when we're hurting, we have a terrifying experience, we're going down, 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 lower, lower, lower. We've got to be able to look up and kind of climb higher and higher and higher to have something to look forward to. And that's really what this passage tells us, is that through our brokenness we encounter God, through our joy we encounter God, and that he will fix it, he will repair our problems but not yet. It's going to take some time. And I feel like our life is, we are stretched between this brokenness and the joy that we have in God when we belong to him, but also that's awaiting us. So for Christians, when you accept Christ, when you become a Christian, it's, it's this picture of this up, down, these mountains is something we see in our spiritual lives. You know, we need to come to God at a time. It's an event. But then over and over, as we endure brokenness throughout our life, we're going to go through this kind of up, down. We need a lot of bridges to get over the dark times in our life, right? So it's this up, down motion that we experience. And we've got to get, what is that bridge? How are we going to get across that? Do you guys feel like, I feel when I'm struggling that I'm really pulled like a suspension bridge with tension and compression. You're just pulled back and forth. And so what is this bridge? How are we going to get across? And so we'll, we'll go back to this passage. Um, in verse 25, it kind of talks to us about this idea of the bridge, of getting from Sinai to Zion, of getting from our brokenness to our joy. And verse 25 says, See to it that you do not refuse him who speaks. If they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, how much less will we if we turn away from him who warns us from heaven? At that time, his voice shook the earth. I was talking about at Sinai when there was that earthquake and God came down. 
Um, but now he has promised once more, I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. And this is kind of a picture of in the future, what God is going to do when he comes back to make everything right. And the words once more indicate the removing of what can be shaken, that is created things, so that what cannot be shaken may remain. And this is why we're receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. So let's be thankful and worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. I want you to think about, though, this bridge. If Jesus is this bridge, if like what the text is saying, if he's speaking to us, if he's there to help us get across this barrier, right? And it's something that we go up and down and up and down. It's something we see, like we see this in nature. This is kind of like um, this up and down pattern. We see this in childbirth, right? You know, it's like an up and down roller coaster experience. We see this in nature with the seasons. You see things growing and blooming. And then you go through a period where it's dark, um, and you experience that, that dying, that death. Uh, and we feel, you know, we experience that in our, our personal lives. Even our spiritual lives sometimes go through a roller coaster. This is a pattern we see a lot in Scripture in the Beatitudes. It's kind of an up-down. Uh, you look at the Lord's Prayer, uh, Psalm 23. You know, it's like kind of an up-down pattern that you see. Uh, it's just kind of everywhere. And you start noticing it and you realize, wow, this is just kind of a part of life, this up-down. So we've got to get good at the up down we've got to get comfortable moving from brokenness to joy and waiting and being stretched between these two realities that we have to experience um, so we want to get on a bridge we want to find a way to do that and these verses talk to us about um, Jesus being the way for us to do that, that he will walk with us in that way, that he'll speak a good word to us, uh, that we shouldn't refuse him. When I was reading these, I, 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 had a, I got really excited because uh, I started realizing this is kind of the linchpin of these verses because what it's really talking about, when Jesus comes back, you know, when, at the end of the age, when God comes to fix all the brokenness in our lives, all the brokenness in the world, something terrifying is going to happen. Another earthquake is going to happen. Things are going to be shaken up in this world. Evil people who think they can run around and do what they want, they're going to be shaken up. And um, the thing is, though, if you belong to God, you'll be safe. Uh, I think about this, I, my dad, I was a real daddy's girl. I'm still very close to my dad. We talk every day. And I enjoyed my relationship with him, you know, kind of in this, we're going to cultivate this image of the fire, right? Uh, he was warm and loving and funny and friendly. He provided uh, protection for me provision for our family. Uh, he brought so much to our family in a positive way, like a fire would if you had to cook over the fire. Uh, we think of, you know, roasting marshmallows, all these happy memories. This is what my father did for me. But if anyone ever hurt me, I knew that my father would stand out as a wall to protect me. Okay, so we have this image of if you belong to the Father, you are safe and warm and love. If you try to hurt someone who belongs to him, you will endure his wrath. Uh, I always knew as a kid, I was like, you know, if anyone ever tried to kidnap me, I really feel sorry for them because my dad would hunt them down. <laughs> and consume them like a fire. You know, he would not stand for anyone hurting his girl. Uh, I'm a mom, and in a room this size, you know, there are women here who didn't have a father to protect them, who didn't have a husband who treated them the right way. Maybe you can't relate to that image in any way. Uh, but think about the way that we love people who are close to us, and we care for them, and we want to protect them. Um, I feel that way about, you know, my three kids. I, I can be like, I'm a really sweet, nice person, 
but I'm a mama bear and I really feel like if you hurt my kids, I will run over you with my minivan. I just want you all to know I have a minivan. I will use it back off, you know, leave my kids alone. I will hurt you. And this is really the sense of these verses. We're getting this message that you know, I know you're suffering I know you're hurting. You know, even as my dad being so loving and warm, still bad things happen to me. Uh, he was there to care for me and love me. But if someone hurt me, he would step in. Now you have this privilege of belonging to God. And if you belong to him, if you give your life to him, then when the time comes for him to come back and literally shake this earth, to right every wrong, to consume every hurt, you will be safe. But if you don't know him, this passage is a warning. It's telling you, you are not safe. You must belong to God. Or when everything is shaken up, you think your life is shaken now, you wait till he comes back in a terrifying moment and you will not have his protection. So he's really begging you. I feel like this is... Um, I do this in a much smaller way with my children. I'm just like a super lovey, touchy mom, sometimes too much. I know I kind of bother them. And I, they get home from school, and I'm like, oh, oh, I love you so much. And I give them this big, lovey, huggy, you're just so wonderful, and I love you. And then I get, like, start thinking about them leaving me someday, and I start, like, squeezing it. Oh, don't ever leave me. You know, it's like, I mean it, I'm not kidding, don't leave me. This passage is kind of like that. It's this big, you know, I love you so much. Think about Zion. Think about heaven. Think about everything that's coming. It's totally worth it. All of the hardship you go through, all of the persevering in faith, it's totally worth it. I'm giving you this huge lovey hug. I'm going to take care of everything. But don't leave me. It's not safe. It's this squeezing you in and saying, Watch out. I love you so much. I want you to be safe. Get behind my protection so that when I shake everything, you will be safe and the world will be changed. And when God does that, when he comes back in that power, he is going to fix all the brokenness. And there will be an eternity full of joy and love. Is it worth the wait? The scripture says it is. And we're reminded that it is because of something very important. It's a promise we can count on. And it's this reminder that we're receiving a kingdom that can't be shaken. So, yeah, you should wait. You should keep persevering in your faith. You should keep trusting God, even through this brokenness. Keep walking on that bridge with him. Because he is going to give you a kingdom that will never shake. When your life won't tremble and it won't fall apart. And this should help us to be thankful. That's really good because when we're facing a lot of brokenness, it's not easy to be thankful. If you know your, your life's not going to get back to normal, you may never feel good again. You may live with constant pain. You may struggle with addiction. You may have a loss that you will never regain this side of heaven. We can be thankful that God is going to fix it. And I love this image that he shares this um, that God's a consuming fire because I want to know that someday the things that aren't right in my life are not going to hurt anymore. The sadness that we experience, the pain, the loss, we want to know that it will be consumed like a fire. And those burdens, those ashes will just be able to float away. So I want to encourage you tonight to respond to God and thankfulness. And I really want to come in a gentle way because I realize that um, for some of you, you may be here and you have a very raw uh, form of suffering that you're experiencing. You may have kind of a gaping wound in your heart and you're not quite ready to be thankful. Uh, when I first got this verse, I really wasn't ready for it. I was hurting too much to really, I didn't even really understand what it meant. Uh, I wasn't quite ready to even study it. It was just kind of something I needed to put in my back pocket. And so if you're somebody who's come tonight and you're kind of in that tender, that raw moment, 
and you don't feel like celebrating and you don't feel like uh, coming here and putting on a, a fake smile, you're really hurting, I just want to encourage you that it's okay. You don't have to come here and be fake and you don't have to pretend that you're happy. Uh, we, we go through these ups and downs and this is a really wonderful place to be because I think most of us get that. We understand we've all been there. And I, I hope that tonight, even if you're going through something hard, you can worship God by thinking about the fact that He is going to fix it. He will consume your burden. Almighty Father.